Welcome to Accuracy Third, an oral history of Black Rock, where we take your stories and contextualize them into the greater tapestry of the Burning Man experience. I'm D-Day. And I'm Rex. Today we'll be having a conversation with Violet, a volunteer who works with the Gate Perimeter and Exodus team during the Burning Man event. Violet bounces between a couple stories today, stories about passion generally. Some of it's that sexy time passion you automatically assumed it would be. Violet also talks about another facet of passion, however. The passion that people experience when things don't always go their way. A quick programming note. What you're about to hear is an early recording we did without a mixing board or an engineer. The audio's pretty good, but to be honest, I get a little yelly when I get excited. So be warned, there's a smidge of uneven volume in this episode, which will get under control just as soon as D-Day learns how to modulate his voice. But first, Violet takes us through Passion on Gate Road, an interesting take on high school passion, and finally, what passion is like in a camper trailer. In 2014, rain at the beginning of the event shut down all motor vehicle traffic on the playa. Staff vehicles could not drive staff to or from their shifts at the gate, outside the perimeter fence, or at other locations beyond the main city. Staff who were already on shift couldn't get relieved, so they worked their volunteer jobs for a dozen or more hours, with no sustenance but the water they came with and the single-serving chips and granola bars they had packed as snacks, which then became their meals. This wet and wild weather event closed Gate Road. Participants, excited to arrive at Burning Man and start their party, discovered that Gate Road was backed up to the highway. Only in the desolation of Nevada could anyone call 447 a highway. And the backup kept getting longer and longer as more and more people arrived to find that still no one was allowed to enter the event. This literal quagmire was reported on the national news, which resulted in my mom writing me an email about a report she saw that wondered if this was the year we'd cancel Burning Man because all the roads in the city had washed away. That's when people on the news, and everyone on the playa, started giving the catastrophe competing nicknames. Oh, I believe you mean, uh... Mudpocalypse slash Waiting Man of 2014 on opening day, which was delightful. Don't get me wrong, that was awful. No one wanted this to happen. People were stuck for almost 24 hours. It was terrible. They had no supplies. Like, the bathrooms filled. It was it was not good on so many levels. So there's a lot of people who are like, look, my, my car would be fine driving on this right now. And I'm like, right, that's, you're, you're not wrong, but... But we're not talking about your car, we're talking about these 20,000 vehicles that are behind you, some of which are heavy box trucks. So, you know... We- Woo! Mud! Yeah. Right. Yeah, he's like, look, we know how to deal with mud. All you gotta do is you gotta put metal sheeting down over it. That's what they do at some of these festivals, and then you can drive on that. And I'm like, that's that's genius. Do you have hundreds of miles of metal sheeting lying around? <laughs> because we could totally make this happen. Yeah, Let's do you do mind that. turning the fuck around yeah. and going to Reno for that? Because that's a great idea. Right. Plates, I think this is the perfect solution. Let's do this right now. It's like, look, radical self-reliance, you're supposed to come with all everything you need to survive. But And a lot of people legit didn't, and that's fair. We can mock them for that. And then there were the cases where... It was like a a caravan of people all in one camp together, and half of them got through and half of them didn't. So, like, the car with all the water got through, and the guys that got stuck were the car with all the bacon. Okay, Burning Man's not like a barter economy, but Waiting Man was. And so they're like, what we did, we cooked all the bacon, and we traded it for water. (laughs) Yeah, good job. Yeah. Some and the car with all the lube was doing fine. Yeah. They didn't they even were realize they set. were hungry. BLM guy comes up and is joking with those guys. Oh, hey, uh, too bad you weren't one like further ahead in line. You would have made it through before we closed the gate. And I was like, well, no. Well, yeah, they would have made it through. But uh, they'd be that car that's stuck over there. So I'm, I think they actually got the better end of the deal. Because that truck that tried to go for it and has a broken axle, I'm not sure anyone really wants to be that. But uh, yeah, okay, sure. Aren't these guys the unlucky ones with all their bacon? Everyone's been stuck out there. The crew's been stuck out there for 24 hours uh, with no food or water also, like just like the people stuck on the road. It's not like we have special magical powers to like get food or water out in the desert. Our crew leads who've been on, on shift for like 24 hours, not a good day for them. Gate, AKA Gate Perimeter and Exodus, AKA Gape, AKA those goth kids that by and large aren't the same goth kids from Death Guild, is a team of Burning Man-managed volunteers 
who deal with all the traffic that comes into and goes out of Black Rock City. They secure the perimeter of the event and make sure no one goes wandering out into the Playa Wasteland to dehydrate and die. They help everyone escape the event all at once in the fastest way they can safely get you gone. And they hang out at the staff bar, the Black Hole, wearing black boots, black jeans, and black t-shirts, smoking cigarettes around a burn barrel all night, every night. So I get sent out there on a skeleton crew that's meant to relieve our, our staff that's been out there for almost a full day. Like, they had food and water to begin with, but that, that uh, was exhausted. Our crew was really lucky in that they got the shift change done at 6 a.m. right as the rain started. It, it was the box office that had been on shift for 20 hours, unfortunately, and they were the front lines of dealing with angry people. Aww. Our shift, uh, like, our crew had only been on for 12 hours at this point, um, except for the shift leads who had been on longer. When we came out to relieve that crew, you know, they, they still couldn't go home because we couldn't run the buses, but they could at least go sit and not deal with people. And uh, that, that became my job and the job of a few other people. We could yeah. see it from uh, like Space. the little observation <laughs> uh, areas that we had. And the headlights were just like fading off into the distance. It was X bad. miles away. So yeah. we were kind yeah. of joking because like a civilization had sprung up in the line at Waiting Man. Oh, yeah. And so we were like, oh, that's what new- happens in Dila. Right. Well, we're like, your new camp address is your, your lane number and then the, like your lane and then the number of cars you are back from the front. So it's like <laughs> lane four, car seven. That's your camp address. That's Remember great. Remember that. <laughs> uh, yeah, the people up in the front were joking around. They were all right. We kept them in good spirits. Yeah, they were the, tired. The people in lane to car 749. Yeah, they were not so having scary. it, but some of them walked all the way up to the front to tell us just how upset they were. <laughs> and I'm not really sure why they think we control the rain. Or because the fact it's not a part of the plan. It was not. Also, the fact that the playa is made of plaster, basically, and you can't drive on it when it's wet because it's plaster. If it rains out there and you walk across the playa, Within two or three steps, you have like three quarters of an inch of dripping, plastery, concrete goop. So it is near the site of what used to be a very large gypsum mine. The mud is literally part plaster when it gets wet, and it, it will cake onto your shoes, it will cake onto your wheels of your bicycle or of your car, to the point where they will no longer turn... And in, if it's a bike, it'll just stop rolling. And if it's a car, it will break your axle. And if it's your shoes, it, you'll get what are called playa platforms. And also then the next year, your the soles of your shoes will fall off, I found out, because of the... <laughs> because it's pretty damn corrosive. Yeah, it's very, it's, it's awful. Yeah. And so, you know, we had a lot of people that wanted, were like, so done, and they just decided they were going to walk towards the city <laughs> and then, like, couldn't walk after they got, like, 400 feet and then, like, fell down and were, <laughs> and we couldn't rescue them and then, like, crawled their way back and it was, it was not a pretty sight. So we had a lot of people make the trek up to the front of the line to yell at us because that's helping anyone. It has to be somebody's problem. Well, it does have to be somebody's problem, and they really, really wanted to make it our problem. Maybe if enough people yelled at you. That lady piping up in the background is Cream Pie, one of Violet's friends since college. She's also D-Day's wife. And I'm lucky to have her. No shit you are. Let's get back to the story. Right, right. So one guy, you know, and like, look, I, it's a shitty situation. I get that. Yeah, so, but you're pulling in overtime. Yeah, right, right. Yeah, oh, my my salary of zero. But Love time and a half. Time and a half of zero. <laughs> zero Damn right. and a half, that's dope. Right? So... So this one guy, I think he was my favorite, besides the guy that wanted to fix this entire situation with metal sheeting. I was, like that. He was also <laughs> a chef. A he, yeah, he is a doer. He, okay, to be fair, he came to me with solutions, yeah. okay? Not just with problems. This other guy just wanted to offer a problem. He's telling me, like, he and his family, and they have a small child, you know, weren't prepared to be trapped out there for, they were camping with a big camp. So, you know, they didn't bring everything they needed. Their their camp had a lot of their supplies and they were, you know, had been there for 12 hours and they had a little kid and they didn't have enough food and water. And, you know, I'm like, okay, this is like legitimately a problem. Yeah. Parent, Actually what we're out there to deal with. Right. I'm right. like, okay, this is a parent. He's scared for his child. And then he's like, I brought millions of dollars of sound equipment out here, and you are preventing me from getting there. And he starts talking about the org, the like Burning Man org, and how they never give him support. The org never gives 
support to the big sound camps and I mean that may may be true. I really don't know. That's not my in my job description and also We're not a music festival. Right. Right. <laughs> and also like that's just that's just not my job. Stop trying and to I, make I us a music festival. I don't I don't work for the org, so I'm I'm kind of confused at this point. He's talking about the sound camp and I was like, "Well, that sounds really frustrating that you don't get enough support. I'm not really sure how I can help you in this particular moment with that that issue." And he just kept repeating the phrase, millions of dollars, millions of dollars, as if that was supposed to somehow make me more sympathetic to his cause. And at some point in this process, my shift lead uh, steps in because this is, has been escalating verbally. And I, my poor shift lead, who's at this point been trapped out there in the desert for 20 hours, with, bless his heart, is taking over dealing with this man. And I sort of walk over to deal with the people who are having, you know, complete breakdowns. And I just keep hearing millions of dollars, <laughs> millions of dollars from this conversation. And it's so hard not to laugh at that. Right back to the millions of dollars of sound equipment and the fact that he was so far, so close yet so far from his millions of dollars was really what was was killing him. He wasn't in the truck with it. It was in the waiting for It was in the camp. Him. So yes, he didn't so he even was... set it up. Fuck that guy. No, but it was his. And he can couldn't... we agree? Fuck and that guy. Yeah. Is it possible that the sick child's name was, was millions, millions of dollars? <laughs> no, I, I'm going to say I had not considered that. Who knows what this child's playa name is? And maybe it's millions of dollars. Yeah. Because I can see this guy giving that playa name to yeah. his child. Oh, um, poor little millions. I think you, yeah. <laughs> oh, millions of dollars. Oh, you have no uh, His surname was Uff Dollars. <laughs> <laughs> We'll have to do some creative editing yes, to obfuscate the nature of who is whom. Yes. And by we have to do creative editing, we mean Beth has to do creative editing. Hi, Beth. Hi, Beth. Thank, Thank you, you for this, for Beth. Thank you for the creative editing. Um, it might be wise to not name somebody you're going to tell a questionable tale of. Yeah, I feel like she that's would some be, like pretty good uh, hard and fast integrity that we should be writing down at some point and like these following. Are, these are generally the very good rules. I feel like she'd almost be disappointed not having the attribution. Uh, but uh, just, just she it, was once on southernbukkake.com. She was on, <laughs> on southernbukkake.com. <laughs> should I be interjecting things or can you totally hear me? Please uh, contribute. So we had this this wonderful friend from from college who uh, had always wanted to go to Burning Man. And finally, was able to go for the first time, and she was so excited, so excited. We were there early because we were both working crews. On opening night, we had a bunch of people move in next door, and uh, one of these groups uh, was a father-son team. They were Dutch, living <laughs> in Colorado. We weren't really sure how old the this this boy was, but uh, you know, he was enthusiastic to be a Burning Man also for the first time. So they were setting up camp, and uh, my friend is, is like, hey, that boy's pretty cute. And I was like, yeah, okay. Now, how, how old are these two? Well, at the time, we don't know. He looked real smooth. He looked real smooth, but uh, they would hang out in our camp always as a pair, because the father, you know, was concerned. Well, he was trying to hit on my friend. So the younger one kept telling stories about high school, and, you know, my, my friend's uh, crushing on him a little bit, and I was like, okay, look. Like he's, I'm sorry, but he's telling a lot. Of, he's telling a lot of stories about high school. Like you need to find out how old he is. And she's like, No, no, no. I'm sure it's fine. I'm like, No, seriously. He's talked a lot about high school. So of course, his play name for us was now high school. Yeah. And uh, she came. I came home the next day from my shift, and she's like, Oh my god. Oh my god. It's okay. He's twenty. <laughs> <laughs> now bear in mind, we're all in our our, our mid thirties. He would like the, the father would insert himself between the son. And oh her yeah, physically. Anytime, yeah. anytime the the he father and son were were in the ca our camp at the same time. He, he was literally cock blocking. He his was son. literally <laughs> cock blocking his son, but I don't think it had ever occurred to him that his son was going to like have any success with these much older women he, <laughs> that he thought were obviously in his demographic. Or it's, <laughs> it's important to maintain the highly sexual nature of Burning Man by bringing out all the boundaryless people we can. There's an assumption you hear about Burning Man regarding how much sex is readily available in Black Rock City. And the truth of it is, there are people having sex with porn stars. In any city our size, someone is having sex with a porn star. Not necessarily you, though. And the really good part isn't the sex. Although the sex is nice. Oh, of course it is. 
but so is stumbling into sudden intense romances and sharing moments with interesting, fun, beautiful people. Fueling orgy dome from the moment she yes. showed till the moment she left. She got a standing ovation at orgy dome. There was some kind of epic orgasm involved that made everyone applaud. And then I guess it was so impressive. She was invited to like have dinner with the camp that runs orgy dome and use their shower. Wow. Yeah, so that's my campmate. She's she's fantastic. Are there any other? Uh, I'd use her stage name, her porn name, but it's the same it's as the her. Same as her actual Christian name. name. So that's that, that is a bold porn. <gasps> rules move. rules things well, out for the yeah, radio. It's a spelling difference, which doesn't <laughs> play well. I should say she really is the town crier of all things sex related. So if there is anything you know in your life that involves sex, she will run to the nearest camp and announce that it is happening to anyone who may or may not be interested as loud as possible. So she woke up our roommate shouting about the differences in types of fake cum and what they use them for. Yes. Yeah, uh, and nobody gets to complain about being woken up there. So Unless you're in quiet town. Shh! A doodle do. <laughs> <laughs> well, we should really send the town crier of sex to Hushville sometime. Oh, that I think would be delightful. That would be mm-hmm. delightful. What we gotta do is get her on the show and have her tell her own version of this, which <laughs> is gonna really... be so much more detailed. Oh, yes. Yeah. Oh, yes. It, it's really like great second to hand. Have your town oh, yeah. sex it was the situation where I was heading to my tent and then my campmate felt the need to uh, town cry my sex experience. I heard about it, but yes, she you... wouldn't give me details. Well, you that. she I don't... doesn't know. She was creating interest. All she yeah, heard yeah. was sounds from the tent. Now, <laughs> now. That was the clickbaitiest goddamn thing she has yeah. ever said to me. Yes, I, love I love that you're like, she wouldn't give me details. I know details. a smidge of information. Okay. okay, she wouldn't give you details, but did she, did did she or did she not describe in detail the sound she heard from the text? Oh, yeah. Yes. Um, so when you say but, detail, but you might, let's not you might not want not me detailed. to know who you're making those and, sounds with. And well, then she didn't there were know. rising squeals <laughs> increasing in frequency no, she, for 45 she's, seconds. She's like, I know, I grew up <laughs> on a farm. No, no, no. She doesn't describe them, she reenacts them. Delightful. It's, it's, it is delightful. It's like a minor bird. And the best part is, <laughs> the next day, having people congratulate you on having a fantastic night and then describe... The sounds they heard. That's one of the things I enjoy <laughs> most about sex at Burning Man. Is yeah. It's never not public. It's not, but I gotta say, everyone really should have a town crier to announce it. Because it really is a, just a fantastic way to like make new friends and have them do, <laughs> know special things about you. Uh, Sometimes your partner is your own sex town crier. And you exit your tent to applause. <laughs> Because of the town crying that happened, a wife of mine. Uh, Yeah, that was the first time we hooked up at Burning Man. And uh, (laughs) I came out of the tent. No one applauded because that wasn't my camp. Well, they didn't know you. (laughs) This is my staff camp. So I just Um. slipped out. I just slipped out in the morning. Had no idea that when he slipped out several hours later, it was two applause. (laughs) I did not get any applause either. I just had people come and congratulate me on my evening. You the got squeaking of the shocks <laughs> were, were their own applause. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, he was talking about uh, some... Yeah, thing. a camper that I just happened to <laughs> build a door for without ever seeing the camper to begin with. It turns out we gave it a really good test, and boy, did those uh, hinges hold up. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that latch. Good latch there. <laughs> good job. I'm... The best part about sex in a camper is it's the shortest walk of shame ever. <laughs> yeah, but also Tumble it's funny when it's right next to your staff camp, you know, the door just opens onto the road. <laughs> <laughs> so it's like everyone watches you go in. Yeah, and the then... road to commissary, like not just any road. <laughs> no, no, like right there. Yeah. And I think it's mine now. It might be. You, you should you enjoy that trailer. trailer. Can't wait. Nice. Fair warning, it's incredibly bouncy. Great. But the door latch holds up great. Oh, Good yeah. Good job on that. Yeah, no worries. Uh, man, I would strongly recommend, first of all, not parking it parallel to the road. I don't care road. about that. What? Yeah, Do you no. care about that? Yeah. No, it's pretty funny, though. I gotta yeah. say. Yeah. <laughs> like, you know. I'm married to a pirate. Were you, were you in the trailer between box office and... Yeah. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, the one with the patchy metal door. Oh, yeah. 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 Oh, so that was a this year's story. That yeah. was this year's story. Yeah, the one that yeah, was rocking spoon. back and forth a lot. Like, directly between two staff camps. And that trailer is kind of eye-catching. Every time I walk past that yes, trailer, it, I look right at it. Yes. Because it's got this 
big, amazing yeah. And door. it's bobbing up and down. Yeah. Right, and Sometimes especially it's when it's bobbing up, up and down. And down. Yeah. Because boy, is that a bouncy trailer. Yeah, yeah. that was chicken sandwich day at commissary. <laughs> I remember that. That was a day where there was still spinach in, uh, in the salad bar for when I got us, there. Wasn't it? Anyway, enjoy your new trailer. Because if you want more applause, hey, if you want applause, because I know you right. didn't get any last time, uh, yeah. I can give you some recommendations. I give her the slow clap. <laughs> That's just your sticky thighs slapping me. Oh. You told me that was my skirt. <laughs> Accuracy Third is engineered primarily by Drunk Bath and ancillarily poorly by D-Day. Our theme music was composed by Jim and Damien. Accuracy Third is produced by Accuracy Third, which is Drunk Bath, D-Day, and Rex. And thank you for visiting Accuracy Third.